AMN Drive Time is sponsored by Aishin, your trusted and reliable source for aftermarket automotive components and technology. Visit AishinAftermarket.com for more information. Ben, welcome to AMN Drive Time, sponsored by our great friends at Aishin. Good to meet you. Glad to have you here Absolutely. with us at our headquarters in Akron, Ohio today. No, it's fantastic being here. We've been here all week uh, shooting a lot of video and production content. Terrific. So, Ben, you are now vice president of, of uh, commercial at the Coach Company, formerly Hennessy Industries. Uh, you make tire equipment. Mm -hmm. Tell us how you got your start in the business. Give us a little bit about your background. Yeah, certainly. So, um, it's a little bit different, I, I would say, from a lot of people in the automotive aftermarket. Uh, I started off in the finance industry for the first year and a half, two years out of, out of school. And uh, shortly, I realized it wasn't my ideal fit. And uh, I joined a manufacturing company and left the finance industry completely and fell in love with manufacturing. And uh, worked up through there for a number of years and entered the automotive space as a part of that manufacturing industry, but joined a company by the name of Myers Tire Supply. Yeah. It's located right, right here in Akron. Akron, Ohio. Absolutely. Fact, and uh, uh, the folks from Myers were here earlier this week. And uh, that led me into Coates. Okay. Yeah. And Myers is it a probably important customer of yours, I suspect. They are, and uh, they've got a team of over 130 salespeople, one of which I was and then became a branch manager, and then uh, came over to the Coates side of the equation, being back in manufacturing where I love it. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. Terrific. You know, my, my father was great friends with Lou Myers, sure. the founder of the company, you know, many, many years ago. They were kind of the same era and they were personal friends and business friends too. So Ben, from what I understand, you've traveled, traveled around quite a bit to get to the position you're in today. Mm -hmm. uh, you've met tons of aftermarket experts along the way. Who have been some of your mentors that have, have impacted you the most over your career? I would say it's, it's kind of twofold. One's personal and one's work. Uh, from a personal side, it's my father. I, he's very much, uh, you know, I mentioned prior to the interview that I played a lot of sports growing up and he was always my coach. And so it was hard work, keep your head down and be humble. And then uh, when I got into the workforce, uh, I actually had the opportunity to work for my father-in-law as part of Myers Industries who Steve Myers, Lou's son, yeah, I know Steve. was running the business at the time. And uh, so he taught me all about manufacturing, the love of manufacturing. Uh, it was a rubber and plastics uh, operation out of Hannibal, Missouri, uh, northeast of St. Louis, roughly about an hour and a half. And uh, gave me a lot of foundational, uh, A, advice, which I still get, and then B, um, experiences. Uh, he put me into continuous improvement, which We'll talk about probably a little bit later with respect to Coates and uh, some of the product offerings that we're bringing to the market here soon. Um, but opportunities to be Six Sigma Black Belt, run continuous improvement on the floor, be a project manager, um, day in and day out, just advice on the financial side of running a manufacturing business. And uh, yeah, I still lean on him quite a bit today for uh, advice on whether it be personnel, strategy, operations, things along that line. Yeah, he's been a great mentor. So as you've gone through your career, Ben, have there been any kind of life-changing, flashpoint, momentous moments that you reflect back on? Yeah, I'd, I'd say um, two things kind of come to mind, um, both with uh, the history of Coates, if, if everybody doesn't know this, was a private company that the Danaher brother, or Danaher bought, which is the, the Rails brothers, in the late 80s, one of the first eight companies that Danaher purchased. And uh, they brought a philosophy to manufacturing that really evolved my thinking. Um, basically, they've got a business system that's built off the Toyota production system. And being able to see lean manufacturing and the lean philosophy in action is very much driven by continuous improvement and identifying waste. And being brought into that fold, more or less baptized, and do it and trained up with it, uh, gives you a different perspective. One of which we're very interested in sharing, which we do with some of our, our national account customers, 
to help them improve their operations, but also to the aftermarket. And uh, so that was one. Um, secondarily would be uh, we were so good and strong at operations within that family of businesses that we were, um, I guess it wasn't in our DNA or natural to be very innovative because we were always driving efficiency. And uh, Fortive, uh, an offshoot, of a subset of Danner when they split into two, uh, really embraced innovation and DNA. And, and I got taken off my job for four months completely. They said, hang the shingle, you're going somewhere else, and you're going to go learn how to really understand customer problems. And so myself um, and four other individuals went out and we interviewed hundreds of technicians, service managers, shop owners, and we had to bring that knowledge back and identify specific problems that were our industry is facing today as well as in the next three to five years, and then provide a solution offering in order to get that and, and get it validated. So it was really about Danaher with the Lean and then with Fortive and now Vontier and Coates Company. Coates was part of all three of those companies at the time, uh, leaning on, on those opportunities. So that four-month stint was an eye-opener. We have a saying that's uh, you got to go to Gemba, and Gemba is where the work's done. It's a Japanese term. And that really embodied kind of and changed how I look at, you know, with the product team underneath my scope and the sales and marketing team underneath my scope, it's, it's something we've embraced. So four months in Gimba. Yeah. That's a third of a work year. Absolutely. And were you traveling around in Gimba or were you just in greater Nashville? Or? No, no. So it, it's a four-step process. It's built off uh, a, a Harvard Business Review book. I think Chris Christensen uh, is, is the author. I think, hopefully I didn't mess up the author's name, but um, it's called The Innovator's Method, essentially, is what we adopted. And so there are four stages. The first stage for the first month was networking. So you talk about getting uncomfortable, is you had to go out and, and reach out inside of industry, outside of industry, whether it's just LinkedIn, calling people out of the blue, et cetera, asking them for their time and talk about their innovation within their company. So we spent two weeks in Silicon Valley, you know, going around and just set appointments with Uber at the time. There was a, an IoT connected um, light bulb company that we met with just a range of people outside of how we think, right? Generally speaking, at least in an industrial company like our own. And in doing so, you spend time there and then you pivot back to industry. And so then we travel to Florida, I mean, all across the United States in order to, whether it be a, a corporate national account, all the way down to single, single pot. I mean, there's even shops and categories of shops that I wasn't aware of. Uh, that back up, you know, for special diagnostic needs and, and doing things along that line that we were able to meet with. What a great so experience. It was a rich experience. You'll draw on that your whole career. You bet. So, so Ben, the company recently underwent a full rebranding and name change mm -hmm. from Hennessy to Coates. Of course, Co Coates is a well-known name as well as Hennessy, of course. Talk about the process, if you sure. would, please. And why was it the right time and what all did that entail for you guys? Yeah, so uh, A, it's not as big of a change as I think, uh, at least a lift from other than business cards and websites and things along that line, uh, because we're known as Coats. Yep. Um, over the course of the last, give it 18 months, maybe 24 months, we've really shifted our, our offering. Uh, we retired Amco brake lathe. Uh, we retired Beta Wheel Weights. And we're evolving our portfolio for the needs of the future. And that's all centered underneath Coates brand. And so Coates traditionally is known as trusted, reliable, and we're adding this innovation piece to our, our brand as well. Uh, it's designed to perform, engineered to last is how we think about it. Yep. And when you do that, uh, there's really two opportunities for us that we see that we can add value. One is shop productivity workflows, not just the equipment, but how the entire shop works. And then secondarily, there's the customer experience workflow and how we interact with the consumer and help our customers interact with the consumer. And so changing the brand for Coats is going to envelop kind of those two missions. You mentioned Amco, mm -hmm. which was a famous name in the business. And I spent a week at the Amco break school. Mm -hmm. In nor uh, northern uh, north Chicago. of Chicago, in yep. uh, uh, where was it? In Lincolnshire. That's it. 
And I spent a week at the uh, break school and a week at the alignment school. Absolutely. In the mid-80s. <laughs> there's a, there's a, a ton of history in, at the, and we're very proud of the AMCO, right. AMCO brand. It's just uh, the offerings changing yep. and we're trying to consolidate underneath this one umbrella. But yeah, there's certainly a lot of great stories, history that goes along with the AMCO brand. Well, of course, the family was the Wackers. The yep. Wacker, Wacker Drive in Chicago is named for the Wackers, right? Absolutely. So, Ben, traditionally, Coates has been known as reliable, quality manufacturer of tire changers and balancers. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the business for a long time. Why go down the alignment path, the tire inspection path, and branch into the other service categories? Sure. So, as I mentioned just previously, but I'll go a little bit deeper on yeah. this how we're thinking about those workflows. Um, in the past, we used to think about specific operations, like you would think of a brake press within the manufacturing facility or welding area and making improvements with respect to those specific operations. But really, it's about the value stream, right? And so in, in lean manufacturing, we have a tool called value stream mapping. And we start at the customer and that experience, and we, we map every single process step backwards to our supply chain. And when we do that, we identify waste opportunities or process improvement opportunities there. And that's how we're thinking about the aftermarket experience, particularly with the consumer. And so when you do this, you gotta have not just the tire changer, not just the wheel balancer, you need to have an additional offering that's gonna provide that full experience for not only the shop, but for the customer, which is why we're branching off into those additional offerings here recently. So, as you know, we live in an era of data. Data is king, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you always want more of it to inform your business decisions, and Coates is now offering shop productivity software. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so this is a, a very exciting uh, offering that we're bringing to market, and it's, it's a convergence of this lean philosophy as well as the customer experience, as I, as I mentioned. So when you lay out a value stream map like we do at the factory, it's easy for us to pull the data, right? All of our systems and processes are producing data every single day. And so uh, generally in, in lean manufacturing philosophy, there's eight types of waste. You know, and I, def, it's, it's, the monogram is downtime, defect, overprocessing, weight, unused creativity, um, transportation, inventory, et cetera. And we're able to map that out and see what, what, where we're falling down. And, and, and we need to embrace that as a manufacturer to stay competitive in the United States, in Nashville. And so uh, we want to bring that to the shop. And, and by having this shop productivity software, essentially we're helping those shops collect their data, analyze it, and, and make those improvements. And until you can quantify that, that waste time, which we have many studies and, and real life examples where it would take an hour and 55 minutes for somebody to basically get an oil change. But we know that it only takes a fraction of that time. So what's causing that delay? Right. It could be waiting on parts, waiting on customer approval, you know, waiting on, waiting on, waiting on, et cetera, yep. and, or training, et cetera. And so bringing the shop productivity brings visibility to what's actually happened in the back shop. And why I think it's the most important is one of the key existential problems that our industry faces is technician shortage and technician retention. And so oftentimes at the end of the day, that technician is getting hammered by a service manager. I need to get these cars so I, we can get the invoice and get the customer out the door. Um, but they don't know what transpired from when the repair order was created to when it was completed. Now we fill that in with all that information. And so really systemic improvement can be made. And not only do, well, we'd like to change the question from, do we have a, a technician shortage in the industry to do we have a productivity issue uh, in the industry? And if we can help you know, address that productivity, we end up making customers happier because they're getting their cars fixed in a, in a more timely manner and then better customer experience. And then the flip side of it, those technicians can turn more hours which means they get paid better, which means we have a better retention opportunity. Yeah, that's great thinking. We've been talking about the technician shortage in this industry for 
years and years and years, maybe decades, right? Absolutely. And that productivity angle makes a lot of sense. And we live that every single day in manufacturing. We have yep. that same issue. Right. You know, getting qualified welders, getting qualified machinists, et cetera. And so uh, that process improvement piece is, is critical for our industry. So, Ben, looking out over the next 10 years, kind of a couple things here. How do you think the tire equipment's going to um, need to evolve? Uh, as an example, EVs, right? Yeah. You must get this question a lot. We do. There's a lot of talk about EVs. And how does your company play into that? What does it mean? So, for example, I understand we're going to need a different construction of tires for, mm -hmm. for EVs to be made in a different way, and that's going to affect you guys in a big way. Yeah. Yeah, Bill, so if you think about just the tire change equipment alone, it's pretty straightforward for us. Uh, we have a perspective on what's going to be required to change a tire, particularly an EV tire going forward. But you think about the customer experience, the evolution of the lift, and, and what we think of as the operating table within that, uh, yep. that shop is going to evolve in order to accommodate EVs, as well as this connectivity piece and this data, data piece that we we're talking about earlier, you tie the EV change, the complexity of the vehicles, and, and this data connectivity convergence, potentially with lean philosophy, and uh, the offering is going to evolve quite a bit over the next five years, and we're excited about it. So, focused on EV in particular. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's getting a lot, a lot of chat these days, <laughs> right? There is, and... Uh, Are you going to have some sort of a lift or a table or something to be able to manage taking these batteries out of the car and move them out of the way because they're as big as this table, these batteries, right? That, that is certainly one aspect, and, and there are many more that we're thinking through at this point. And, and, and going back to um, what we were talking about earlier, engaging at Gemba and going out to see, you know, those that are already doing some of the service. Right. And when I was uh, on that, that four-month stint that I was telling you, that, that was almost five years ago, and uh, we were visiting several EV uh, shops specifically over in California just to get a perspective. It had to be California. So, so we've been working on this for quite a while. So Ben, before we let you go, mm -hmm. we have a tradition here we call the lightning round. And I'm going to get a few questions for you and you're going to give me an answer off the top of your head. <laughs> okay. You ready? Uh, I think so. You sure? In, in Nashville, we call this the boom boom room. All right. Well, this is the boom boom room. <laughs> Breakfast or dinner? Oh, dinner. Netflix or go to the theater? Netflix, for sure. Well, you have three kids, so... I do. Nine-year-old, 18 and 16? Yeah, I think for, we went to the movies for the first time here uh, probably in six months, about two weeks ago. Wow. Yeah, as a family. Off-roading or track days? I'd say off-roading. I'm a truck guy. Age when you changed your first tire? Oh, I would say 26. For me, it was 22. My first job was working yeah. at a Goodyear tire and rubber store yeah. in Philadelphia on, but, on Broad Street. Now, bike tires don't count, right? No, okay. bike tires don't count. <laughs> All right. I've changed a lot of tires <laughs> using your equipment and used your balancer. Automatic or stick shift? Automatic. Although I learned on a stick, it's been a while since I've driven one. So, although I was mentioning, I've got two daughters that I'm teaching to drive right now, 18 and 16, and I'm going to have to teach them the stick. Oh, you are? Yeah. That's going to be a Well, test. one of them wants a Jeep. She's begging. That's going to be a test on your relationship. <laughs> <laughs> so, I did not know that there was such a thing as the MM, like Mary, LF, which is Major League Fishing. Yeah. And I understand you're a major league fisher man or NFL. Uh, NFL or NFL? Well, personally, man, that's a tough one. So I'm going to go MLF. You know, the, the fishing and the reason why is I grew up in St. Louis and we lost two NFL teams. So, so you got to go MLF. Yeah, exactly. Just on principle. Favorite season to fish? Oh, it's going to be... Um, Fall to winter. Okay. Yeah, I like to trout fish. Okay, so related. Best place to go fishing in Tennessee? Oh, in Tennessee, it's South Holston. It's right below the dam. So there's a lot of tailwaters with TVA in Tennessee. Yeah, right. I've 
yet to fish the Smokies, but they're all little brookies. And uh, I love getting a brown trout on the line. So you go over to South Holston and Wauktega, uh, up in northeast Tennessee, right at the tailwater. There's a lot of fun there. Ben, it's been great to have you on AMN Drive Time, sponsored by Aishan. It was a pleasure. Appreciate it. Glad to have you here. Thanks. <laughs> AMN Drive Time is sponsored by Aishan, your trusted and reliable source for aftermarket automotive components and technology. Visit AishanAftermarket.com for more information.